our webinar series. <clears throat> These are our short 30-minute webinars designed to give you maximum impact for your valuable time. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, this segment is going to re review automated virtual server provisioning easily attained with a service catalog. I'm your presenter today. My name is Ben Alexander. I've been with PMG for over a decade. Uh, I started with virtualization probably around 2000, 2001 with VMware GSX server. I also have experience with the rest of the VMware stack, uh, OpenStack, and Amazon EC2. <clears throat> so housekeeping, uh, please during the webinar ask questions in the chat window. We'll look at the end of, at the, end of the event to, to take an answer to those. Again, we're scheduled for 30 minutes. Um, also, if you think of something later, please feel free to email me or reach me on Twitter. And a copy of this deck and the recording of the webinar will be provided afterwards. <clears throat> so let's look at the agenda. What are we going to talk about today? First, let's talk about the business automation benefits. Why do we want to automate? Then we'll talk about the how of automation focusing on service catalog. Third, we'll talk about the types of virtual server provisioning, what and where. Uh, then we'll look at requesting a virtual server, what does that end user experience look like, and what's the back end process. And then we'll go into a live demo of the service catalog and automatically virtu virtual server provisioning. <clears throat> then we'll follow up with a customer success story and take your questions at the end. <clears throat> Okay, so what are the benefits of business automation? So we're looking at three buckets here, speed, tracking, cost management. Um, first, with speed, this is probably what you think of most when you think of automation. How do we deliver our servers quickly? I'm talking about hours or maybe even minutes, not weeks and months. So we're looking to reduce manual effort, reduce those errors that occur, make sure we have accurate configuration. So we're trying to start our projects quickly, uh, speed up their approval process, keep our customers happy, and give them what they need quickly. And so this ties into tracking, right? Your customers submit a request for a server, that's great, but you need to make sure they know where and what is happening with their activity. So this means customer may know that their manager has it for approval. You want to make sure that you can tell your customer if it's held up in the server process for some other reason. Again, always let them come to service catalog or give them email notifications about their requests. Also, this ties into integration with CMDB. <clears throat> we want to make sure we always have an accurate picture of who has what and what's the status of it. And then thirdly, cost management. So some organizations, you may have users going around IT. They may be going to Amazon, for example, and getting their server very quickly, um, but in the end, what happens is IT ends up having to support this anyway. So let's bring the users in through you know, our service catalog, give them what they need quickly, and avoid the shadow IT. So it's great that <clears throat> we can now quickly automate many servers, but we can have problems if we don't also look at deep provisioning of those servers. So make sure your users give you, you know, a time frame of, of when they need these servers. If they need them indefinitely, just you know, make sure they have justification. So we want to make sure we can deprovision as needed, so reduce cloud, cloud sprawl, you know, keep your costs down, reduce your security risks, and also chargebacks. You know, give your users easy to see pricing and charge back to the to correct department where necessary. <clears throat> so how do we do this automation? Well, we say service catalog. The service catalog is your user, self-service, it's your shopping cart experience front end. Uh, ties back into business process flow for fulfillment, approvals, and integration. You can provide your users rich content, knowledge information here. Um, this is where you also, when users come to look at the reports, uh, you know, what do I have available to me? What are all my servers or my group servers? So drive your users to service catalog to avoid having them to call IT or go to the help desk when they can go to service catalog and get all the information they need on their own. Okay, so what are the actual types of virtual server provisioning? Well, all right, very basic new server. I need one server, very simple example. I think a very common scenario is a bundle of servers. This is your user saying, 
hey, I need a website and, of course, a database server. Well, let them come in, request that as a package. So this could be your Microsoft IIS web server bundled with the SQL server. Or for Linux, you know, Apache web server and a separate MySQL database server. This is the whole platform as a service idea here. Uh, even more interesting is requesting a new environment. So let's say, for example, I need service catalog. Well, I know I need two web servers, two application server, maybe a database cluster, and a load balancer. Provide that whole bundle to your users if possible, and they get everything as one request. So that's great for requesting the start of stuff, but how about modifying those existing servers? <clears throat> Most often, users are going to have an idea of what they want, but more likely than not, they may say, oh, that's not enough memory. I need more memory. So make it very easy for them to come to service catalog, find their existing server, and request changes to it. And again, very important, decommissioning. If you automate successfully, you're probably going to have a lot more servers than you did before. You want to make sure you keep that cloud sprawl in check. You know, remind your users about their decommissioning time frame, and then retire the servers appropriately. And again, the ongoing management of servers and provisioning. Allow your users a way to come in and request or actually perform these operations themselves by rebooting their servers, turning on and off servers, and maybe snapshots. So if the user wants to maybe upgrade their application, they can do a snapshot first and roll back if they have any issues. <clears throat> and don't forget, you can also provision virtual desktops and your software. <clears throat> so where does this happen? <clears throat> so we have our private cloud, a public cloud, and a hybrid cloud. So very usual is in most organizations, your private cloud is your internal data center you know, using virtualization. This most likely is VMware of some sort, maybe some Hyper-V or, or, or Zen server. And I think, uh, you know, as public cloud, everybody's very familiar with Amazon Web Services and what they're doing. And there's also Microsoft Azure as an offering. And then the hybrid cloud could really just be a combination of you using your private and your public clouds, or it may specifically be something like vCloud Hybrid. And then also this OpenStack here, as it's, of course, found in both private and public clouds, but it's also gaining a lot of momentum, and it's interesting in that it really talks to VMware, Zen, or KVM in the background as a, for the hypervisors. And again, desktops, Citrix VMware, you can provision your desktops, which can be very useful, especially for those with a lot of onboarding or contractors or maybe just a large mobile workforce. <clears throat> so how do we get started? How do users go in and request a virtual server? Well, as you see here, <clears throat> we're providing a very simple to use and easy to find, you know, request form. Um, tell your users what you have, give them simple, easy to follow instructions, give them the pricing where it applies. Um, you know, for your basic users, you may want to package these things. You may say, I have a small server, a medium server, or a large server, and those equal out to, you know, one CPU or two CPUs. And for your more advanced users, if you need them to be able to pick any of these, you know, components that they need, we'll provide a way for them to do that. But really, just know know your user base, know what they want, make it easy for them to get to get to it whenever they need to. <clears throat> okay, so after the request goes in, what about the process? What about the the back end of this? <clears throat> so again, we talk about status and status updates. You always want to make sure <clears throat> easy to find where the server request is in the process. You know, part of this is emailing your users, especially when you hit milestones. Just you, know, you don't want to flood them with emails, but give them timely updates that matter to them. Um, integrate with your CMDB again. You want to always record everything there, so you can always tell your users exactly what they have, where is it, keep track of it, tie it back to your costs. And what does the ongoing management look like? So. <clears throat> As part of this provisioning, you can go ahead and automatic, automatically create your change requests, right? Integrate with your help desk or service desk system, create the change request. Let's say, for instance, that uh, <coughs> you're provisioning a server to Amazon and Amazon happens to be down for this 10-minute window. Well, of course, you can automatically retry this at a later time, but also go ahead and create an incident automatically for your help desk to look at it just in case. <coughs> And for your admins, you want to make sure that they have an easy-to-use interface uh, that they can actually go in and create these offerings for your users. 
So this might be giving them a nice, to use, easy to use form where they can pick and make templates or packages and just easily maintain your service catalog environment. <clears throat> and then after the servers are up and running, what about the, the post provision management of this? Well, both for your users in your IT and your admins, give them the way, perhaps like a dashboard, to come in, see their items, uh, request changes to the servers. This could be an easy way for the users to quickly turn on and off the server on their own. You may want to tie your costs into here so the users can see, you know, besides just how, how much the one server costs me, how much is my whole department spending on these servers? And also to review the status of the server. Is it up? Is it down? Is it going to be retired in two weeks unless I do something? <clears throat> okay, so let's actually take a look at the service catalog and how easily we can request a virtual server to be provisioned. <clears throat> okay, so I'm a user, logged in service catalog, and we are interested in servers, so we're going to look at servers first. <clears throat> so here, you know, quickly you can see, especially with these logos, I got Amazon, Red Hat, Microsoft SQL, OpenStack kind of options available to me. Let's start off with a basic user scenario where I want a bundle of you know, a web server and SQL server. <clears throat> you can see in this case, it's a very simple description of the service. And then as part of the configuration of the service, we can actually see, look, how much does a small, medium, and large cost me to set up? What kind of CPU, memory, and storage am I going to get with the Windows server, the IS server, and the SQL server? <clears throat> so you can see I'm logged in as me. I'm going to go to configuration, and I know I have a $2,000 budget, and I'm a power user, so I'm just going to pick large. So I want a large bundle. I'm going to call this something I can remember or identify with. Um, we'll do a service catalog test. And we'll start off in development. Um, I'm very impatient, so I actually want this to start yesterday. And end dates, you know, I think we need this for about six months or so. And then I'll just hit submit. <clears throat> All right, so great. I got a little receipt, you know, order number 717. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the details of that order. <clears throat> okay, so this is where, you know, make sure users can see the status they need. So I can see it's actually approved service request was assigned to, to one of me. Right now, this is my manager, we'll say. Ben Alexander too. So that's great, but now I need actually somebody to prove that. Well, if I flip over and put on my manager hat, looks like I have an email. Saying, hey, you know, this order came in, you need to approve or reject it, take some kind of action. And so, sure, we could drive this person back to the service catalog to look at the request and approve it. But also, think about giving them easy ways to prove it where necessary. So I can just click this checkbox in my email. <clears throat> and you can see that I get a thank you message and the status is now approved. Okay, that's great, but what does that mean to end user over here? Well, let's take a look and refresh our screen, and we can see some updates in the status. So I can see my approve server request was completed by my other self. You can see we automatically had a change request created, and then you can see that actually a server was provisioned by this name. So in a lot of cases, this information right here is, is enough for your users, but you also have a way to show them a graphical representation of the process. So since this request was already approved, we'll see it going all the way across with green arrows, right? Um, but if you follow along, the key items are, here's the approval server request. This is where my manager got an approval, 115, and then a minute later they approved it. And then from here, the request was able to continue on. <clears throat> you can see a part of the process, we had a change request that was created. 
and then the one that I care about the most is where's my server and you can see deploy VM executed 116 I can actually drill down into this if I want to and you can see after the provisioning there was an email to the customer which was me so this is where hey customer your server is ready here's information about it maybe IP address server name you know you have default user account set up that kind of information so we're keeping this simple straightforward you know really a great way to get started of course part of the power is that you can configure all kinds of your processes into here Okay, let's say now I'm a more advanced user and I want a Red Hat server. Well, let's go find virtual server Red Hat and look at that. <clears throat> okay, so you can see some simple text up here. You know, based on your users, you may actually want more than just a few lines. You could actually put very detailed and rich information in this block or even links out to other documents. Um, in the bottom, again, I'm keeping my form pretty simple. I'm just trying to get the necessary information to get started. Sure, maybe I need to know some other things like a project ID or why they even need a server. But that's stuff you can always follow up with later with a user. You can go ahead and get this process started and then follow up with them later with those questions. So again, um, this time I'm on production and you can see, okay, backup service is required. This time, instead of a date, I'm just going to give some ranges, like a three months, 12 months, or unlimited time window. Again, let's go with unlimited, and you can see, well, now i got to provide justification for this. Okay. So now, I can pick out CPU, memory, storage, and I can see CPU costs, you know, memory costs, uh, storage costs. Let's just pick out a few of these. Okay, that's great. $608 a month. My manager is not going to approve that. I think I need to backtrack a little bit. Okay. Secret number to get past approval. Great. So add to cart. You can see ongoing costs, 420. All right, let's submit this. And again, it goes through the same flow. Um, I guess I was not as powerful as I thought. I got hung up by approval again. Okay, so what does this look like after we've had our service provisions? I want to come back in and see everything I have. Well, this is where, you know, based on reporting and dashboarding, you give your users a view of everything they need to see. So you can see here, here are my, here's one of my most recent server requests we just did, and then I have a few others from previously. <clears throat> I have an easy to see status about my server, so I can actually see that, hey, one of these guys is not running. Well, okay, let's turn it on. You can see these buttons right here. This is a power on button. We have a power off button. We have a reboot button. And then we actually have a decommission action. So the idea is maybe I want to just recycle one of these servers. Okay, rebooting. Great. And so part of the back end could be you could allow your users to do this instantly, or you may say, certain conditions they need a approval or follow some kind of process especially maybe decommission you may want to take a few minutes and pause and say hey user are you sure you really want to do this why are you doing this ahead of schedule etc and then also again a lot of times you can create a server <coughs> create a server you're going to say well I don't have enough memory so let's create a change request for that server and this just this tied us over to a change form where I can see what I have and now I can say let's add more memory and then we can choose to submit our request. So <clears throat> we've kept it pretty simple getting to the point of how quickly you can automatically virtual provision your virtual servers right um, so let's back out for a second and actually talk about customer success around this. So talking Fortune 100, leading media and technology company, 
they had a process that previously took a month or more. It was very manual. Uh, now, today, using service catalog tied into the provisioning, they're looking at around 11 minutes. This is a start to finish and user request to service provision. So now they have near zero intervention. They have a very transparent process so their users can always see what is going on. They record this everywhere to make sure they have governance and very good reporting for their users. And again, really they're, they're trying to make sure customers are happy, IT feels good, everybody's winning, right? <clears throat> so in summary, we're talking about automated server provisioning, we've got speed, tracking, cost management. We're leveraging all those to increase our ROI, very importantly, improve our customer satisfaction and increase the IT love. <clears throat> okay, so I saved a few minutes for questions. Just give me one minute here, I'm just reviewing questions that were asked. Okay, so one question is about the dashboard for your users. Um, this could be, so the question exactly is, is the dashboard another front end link to a service catalog request or a separate workflow? Well, the answer is it, it could be any of those or all of them. Um, at least with our service catalog, you can configure this to how you need it. If you need separate workflows for some of those dashboard activities, that's perfectly fine. If you don't, then you can bypass that process there. <clears throat> okay, so another question. What external systems do you integrate with to provide the actual provisioning? Does it take long to complete that integration? Okay, so we specifically look at VMware, vSphere, vCenter, we're talking to vCloud Director and vCloud Automation Center. Uh, we have hooks into Hyper-V, OpenStack, and really anything with an open API and integration key point, one of our strengths in the, in the integration is being able to rapidly tie to other systems. So besides servers, we of course have integration hooks into many other software, right? Help desk, ERP, et cetera. So anything that we don't have today is something that we can feasibly have you know, within weeks. Um, and does it take long to complete that integration? So the, the integration itself, if you're already running your service catalog and you want to start hooking into VMware, for example, it is pretty simple. Um, we have the workflow. We can drag and drop your actions in and actually configure your request. And then again, you can utilize forms or find templates, right? We can provide templates of forms where you can get going quickly and just ask the information that you really need to get your users started. So another question is, as prices with outside vendors change, can you easily adjust this, adjust this in the catalog? Um, yes, uh, it's very simple to, to change your pricing and cost model. Uh, you can do this at the form level or you can utilize maybe your CMDB or another database to tie price and cost to everything that you offer. Um, you know, this is very, probably pretty good Use the Amazon as an example, um, but a lot of times, if you're doing VMware that's in house, and you have a little bit more control of your prices. But you know, if you're going through Amazon or maybe you want to use OpenStack with Rackspace, um, their prices change a lot. Fortunately, they come down a lot, but you can definitely handle those changes in the catalog. Okay, I'm just reviewing some more questions. Okay, so I'm just reviewing some of the, the points. Um, so <clears throat> one question is, does the product come with this type of interface or does it all have to be developed as custom config? 
<clears throat> well, we definitely provide out of the box workflow actions for the majority of those hypervisors. Um, and then more importantly, if you're looking at the front end experience, a lot of that is can be configuration, but we are also creating very easy to use templates that maybe you can use it as a base, right? Um, so it really depends because <clears throat> a lot of companies have very different requirements from the user base. Somebody asked about integrating with HP, CSA, HBOO. <clears throat> yes. Um, we have hooks into both those products from HP. And so that's the important thing to talk about is let's say you have um, a middle layer that you already handle these backend integrations with to VMware or whoever. We can also just talk to your middle layer and, and you can handle the provisioning still the same way you've been doing, but utilize powerful front end service catalog and the whole fulfillment process. So HP, CSA, and O are a good example of kind of that middle layer. But of course, a lot of companies have their own architecture set up and their own security standards. And as long as you have API, we can talk to that instead. Um, interestingly, one of the questions is, <clears throat> any integration with ServiceNow? Uh, yes, we do actually have an out-of-box connector that you can integrate with ServiceNow with. Um, so you actually, for example, a user could come in, ask for a server, and then we could go create that change or incident request if needed in the ServiceNow. Okay. <sighs> I think we're almost out of time. <clears throat> For these questions that are outstanding, we're going to try to reply back to everybody. Also, again, if you think of stuff later, please feel free to email us, um, and we'll try to have the recording of the webinar and a slide deck very soon for you guys. <clears throat>